and I'll just kick off. So um, I will, um, just as we get housekeeping underway, Janet, can you see my screen? I can indeed. Great. Um, I'll control things from here, and um, I think you're kicking off with the introduction. Yes, that's right. Excellent. Good. Well, um, I, shall, I shall begin. So uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the webinar by Policy and Practice, um, and it's titled Universal Credit and the Impact on Work Incentives, a very timely webinar, so it turns out. Before we get started, uh, just a couple of uh, little housekeeping um, points, if I may. Um, just to do an audio check, if you could raise your hands using the control panel on the right hand side just raise your digital hand uh, and give it a wave to Devon so that we can know that we know that you can hear us okay and while you're doing that if I just let you know I'm sure people who've been on webinars with us before um, know that we are um, uh, we, we like to take questions so um, we if you ask questions throughout and then there'll be an opportunity for us to pick them up at the end uh, and indeed we're going to cover uh, cover some of last uh, last webinars um, questions as well. We're going to have a couple of polls and also a survey at the end of the webinar, and we aim to be finished by 11:30 to have you on your way. Um, okay. So without further ado, just before we move on, I'll just check that hands were raised, which uh, I need just need to jump across onto onto a separate screen very quickly. Yes, and they they were fantastic. Thanks. Thanks uh, to those Brilliant. of you that, that did that. It's always such a strange thing doing a webinar. Uh, you're kind of doing it a bit blind, so it's lovely to know that people can hear, hear us. Um, I think then we're going to move on to the speaker screen. So again, in, in, in webinar format, it's always quite nice just to see faces of the people who are talking to you. So this is me and Devon, uh, looking bright and perky-eyed, as we are today. Um, today's agenda, as I was saying, we're going to be finished by 11.30, um, and we have a lot to cover in that time. So the agenda that we're going to talk through, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction and we're going to talk about universal credit, that is, that is the, the main focus of the webinar today. Devon's going to take us a little bit through the policy uh, and Devon is very well placed to do that, which you'll hear about in a moment. We're going to talk a bit about what the policy was originally intended to do and the various iterations it's taken along the, along the way. Um, Devon's going to talk about how universal credit actually works because I think some of the changes, um, you need to understand how the, how the uh, credit, universal credit works to understand how the changes um, can come into play. And then also we're going to have a look at the impact of those changes as well. Um, but it's not a word for it. We're going to take you through how we've arrived at the uh, those analysis insights, um, so you can understand uh, so maybe some of the robustness behind our our uh, numbers. Um, and then we're going to move on to universal credit, the delivery, uh, which I think is the most important part, certainly for many of the local authorities on, on the webinar today. We're going to look at rollout and the rocky path it's had so far and look at some of the outstanding concerns that we know about and indeed that, that may be where um, you want to come and raise some of your own uh, questions as well. And then questions and next steps. So that is, this, that is the focus of the agenda. So just to tell you then, moving on to tell you a little bit about policy and practice. I know many of you probably know us already and it's great to have you on the call, but for those who are, who are new to us, um, policy and practice's um, mission, if you like, our vision is to make the welfare system simple to understand so that people can make the decisions that are right for them. That is what drives us, that is what we're all about. And then the how we do that then, um, this is what I call our onion diagram because it's sort of three levels really. Um, and I, I mentioned there about Devon being well placed to talk about universal credit. Uh, well Devon was a member of the team at the Centre for Social Justice who developed universal credit. Um, and when the policy was adopted by government, he left there to set up policy and practice. He was keen to ensure that the policy intent was actually put into practice and that's still what drives us today. Um, since that time, and together with the team he's built at Policy and Practice, uh, Devon's facilitated conversations between local authorities, local organisations and the Prime Minister's office to ensure frontline feedback about welfare reform policy has been heard. In addition, uh, Devon and the team has helped local organisations to understand the aggregate and cumulative impact of welfare reform changes on their customers so that they can accurately target support programmes. And then finally, to close the loop, the software that Policy and Practice has developed 
simplifies the conversation that frontline advisors can have with customers by clearly showing what benefits they can get under the current system and then under universal credit when they move to that. Um, and it compares the two systems side by side uh, and uses data visualization and color and graphics and so on. Now, given the um, significant changes to tax credits that are announced in the spending review and indeed um, some of the debates that's been that have been going on this week, um, the focus for welfare reform is now firmly back on universal credit. Um, and so this is where this is where we uh, end up today. This is a lovely picture oh, of sorry. Devon and uh, <laughs> a colleague of ours, Lisa, um, and it just helps to just um, just uh, visualise the point I was making there that uh, we seek uh, frontline feedback to help shape policy. Um, and some of the coverage that we received from the tax credit um, debate in the House of Lords. Um, was quite uh, was, was was picked up um, by by national media, um, which we were which we were delighted with, and of course the end result there was that tax credit cuts were overturned. Um, however, tax credit cuts by another name, some may say. Um, yesterday in the House of Lords, um, Lord Kirkwood later on at seven o'clock, uh, Lord Kirkwood talked about um, uh, the debate about the Welfare Reform and Work Bill uh, and he talked about cuts to uh, universal credit uh, work allowances. Um, he had asked policy and practice to do a briefing uh, and the, for him uh, which he then read out and presented in the Lords yesterday um, and so we were delighted to have that opportunity and as I said the, it really underlines the point that um, uh, being close to local organisations like yourself on the call today, um, we can feed that uh, uh, experiences back to the, to the highest, uh, I suppose, the highest level where um, policy can be reviewed. Um, so now that's just a little bit about us and what we do. So, um, oh yes, the Leading Lights Network. Thank you, Devon. Um, we have our next Leading Lights Network event in March. Uh, we're aiming for the 3rd of March, Thursday the 3rd of March, um, and we are going to be sending out invitations hopefully next week um, to that event where it's going to be high profile. We're going to have some good speakers. Um, please do put your hand up or do drop a note, jot, jot a note into the uh, side of the webinar panel there if you would like to be invited just to make sure that we've got you on our invitation list. Um, Leading Lights Network is um, a, a network that we've set up of people that we know are doing brilliant stuff um, and we want to, uh, the policy makers to hear what these people are doing. So this is our network. So more details on that to come, so that's just to save the date for the diary. And now Devon, over to you for the rest of the presentation. Okay, thank you Janet, and I think the, that very helpful introduction, I think that preamble gives an opportunity for um, the large number of registrants we've got for today. I mean, I think what it shows is that universal credit is um, starting to get real for people because uh, I think we've got, uh, I think if everyone registered, I'm not sure whether the software could handle it. Um, uh, but we've got a large number of people on the call today and I think if you do have your questions it would be great to pick those up. Um, I'll just kick off. Uh, Janet, I think you might want to mute yourself. There's quite a bit of background noise on your end. Um, um, so just to kick off, we're going to be focusing on universal credit but I think it's always worthwhile showing the range of changes this is really what's affecting people. So it isn't just one policy in isolation, which is what we're going to focus on today. It's the impact of all of these policies put together. Um, some of them are positive. So the government would point to the national living wage um, increasing to £9 by 2020 uh, and increases in the personal allowance. But actually, for people on lower incomes, there's a lot of changes to benefits that are happening there as well. Um, I'll just check. There may, be other, there may be others on the call um, who can be heard, so I'm not sure if there's anyone in the office listening in, um, but you may want to mute yourselves as well. So, uh, yeah, so on to today's webinar. Today we're going to be focusing on universal credit um, and the understanding the impact of proposed cuts to work allowances, so specifically focusing on the impact of... Um, the changes that were some of the changes that were being debated in the House of Lords yesterday, and some of the changes that were announced in the summer budget, looking at exactly who's impact, impacted and by how much. Um, and then, importantly for us, as well as looking at the policy, we're also going to look at the practice um, and what that means for people on the ground. 
So as Janet said, a little bit of a recap first of all. I think it's important to think about where Universal Credit started from um, when I started to work on it. So that was um, actually before I joined the Centre for Social Justice. But, but when I was at the Centre for Social Justice, we worked on a report called Dynamic Benefits. And what that proposed was a simpler benefit system that was more rewarding for everyone. Um, in order to build a system that was more rewarding for everyone, there were some very specific uh, analysis done on what that needed to look like. Um, but it needed to have generous work allowances to encourage those first steps into work. And it needed to have a reasonably a, a more generous taper than the current system today. So um, whereas people on, under the current system can face tax effective tax rates and, and lose effectively um, one pound for every pound they earn uh, in their benefits and see an effective tax rate of 100 percent. We propose something much lower, 55 percent of net earnings. So that was the original vision of behind universal credit. Um, and in, under that system, work incentives would have improved for pretty much everyone under the new system, and particularly those on lower earnings. Then it became a reality. It was passed in the Welfare Reform Act of 2012 and was uh, began to roll out in April 2013 with the same or very similar levels of, of work allowances, so quite generous work allowances to encourage those first steps into work. But um, where, whereas the CSJ version was uh, more generous than the tax credit system, i.e. it also cost more, I think the DWP and the Treasury decided that in a post-recession, they couldn't afford to spend more on um, in-work support and work incentives. So the withdrawal rate was increased to 65%, and that broadly made it cost uh, more or less the same as the tax credit system did at the time. As we look ahead to April 2016, um, as we know, the um, work allowance, there were cuts to work allowances announced in the summer budget. So that sort of kept that less generous withdrawal rate that the DWP introduced, but it's also made it um, less generous than the tax credit system is today. There, was, there were, of course, attempts to um, make tax credits less generous as well. Those were overturned, but the changes to universal credit weren't. And that has some quite important implications both for policy and also, I think, for politics as well. Uh, which I'll come on to. A quick reminder for those of you about how universal credit works. I find this to be a very useful diagram. So um, this figure just shows that this could, it would look more or less the same for any household. There's a work allowance, which means you get to keep all of your universal credit as your earnings increase up to a certain point, up to the work allowance point. And then uh, you start to lose uh, your your universal credit as your earnings increase, but at a flat rate, that's reasonably generous. Now, this line, this red line shows what was proposed under universal credit. So generous work allowances and a reasonably generous withdrawal rate. So you can see that you're getting to keep more of each pound that you earn because you get to keep your universal credit for longer. The DWP version made this line a bit less generous. Um, but you, you still had the generous work allowances. So those first steps into work shown here at about £400 uh, a month of net earnings was, was still sort of reasonably, reasonably generous. You, you got to earn up to that much and keep your benefits. It was almost risk-free taking that step into work. Some of what's happened now is that we've still got this, uh, this withdrawal rate, the same withdrawal rate as the DWP proposed of 65%. But... The work allowances have also reduced, shown here for a, as a partial work allowance drop. But some people, so families without children, for example, have seen that work allowance go from something reasonably generous to zero. So, you know, that line could, could, uh, could fit here as well. So that's more or less what's happened is that those first steps into work aren't being rewarded as much as they were, once were. Um, so this is, what's, this is a, more or less a summary of what I've said. It's worthwhile noting that cuts to tax credits were planned. Um, to make them less generous as well, but they, they were subsequently reversed, but cuts to work allowances within UC weren't. The government would point to mitigation through a higher minimum wage and income tax allowances, and some of the analysis we've done points, that, points out that that helps some households, but not necessarily those that lost out under the cuts to UC. And it, the cuts to UC exclusively affect working households, as some of the analysis on the next slides um, goes on to show. So this is what's happening to work allowances. It's always worthwhile remembering that. So households without children have seen their work allowances go from 
something reasonably generous to zero. Um, the biggest drop has been for lone parents without housing costs. They had some very generous work allowances initially um, to something significantly less generous, but also, you know, I suppose the government would argue significant. Um, and uh, dis disabled people also keep, um, they've seen some significant drops as well, but it's families without children who have seen it drop to zero. It's worthwhile, you know, just being aware of what's happened to work allowances. But the impact on people's take home incomes is a bit more complex than that. So just because you've had a drop in your work allowance, your actual income loss depends upon your level of earnings. So if you're on a low level of earnings, you um, the work allowance has dropped, but you get to keep, uh, you don't lose all of that. You still get to keep, in this case, 35 pence in the pound because of the way the taper works. If you're on a high level of earnings paying national insurance, then um, you get to keep, let's say, uh, just about 31 pence in the pound. Um, if you're paying tax on national insurance, then it's 76%, uh, percent, uh, it's about 24 pence in the pound. And for people no longer on universal credit, so the highest earners um, who would have been on universal credit but won't be on it anymore, um, they get to keep perhaps the, you, know, you, you could argue the most. So, I mean, I think what this shows is that the impact on people's take home incomes is quite complicated. Um, and as I'm explaining it, I'm realizing that actually, yes, um, it's important being able to do this analysis for each individual household is quite tricky and that's why we have systems in place to help with that. So that's what we've done. So we used uh, some of our modeling software to look at the family resources survey which is a sample of 25,000 households across the country weighted to be representative of the whole population. We modeled the cumulative impact of all of these changes all the way through to 2020 so taking into account the cuts to universal credit but also the increased National living, the, the new national living wage increasing to nine pounds, and the personal tax allowance increased to twelve and a half thousand. So, taking into account the government's mitigation, um, and then we looked at income in two thousand fifteen, in two thousand sixteen, and all the way through to twenty twenty. And we do this for a number of local authorities. So, whereas we're about to show some of the impacts nationwide, we can do this for your local authority, and importantly, each individual household within your local authority to give a very clear picture of income, employment, and poverty. Um, the idea being that if you know who's impacted by these changes, you can then target support that much more effectively. Um, the analysis presented in these slides is preliminary. We're gonna do a little bit more on it, but I think it's um, we wouldn't be sharing it if we weren't confident. So the number of households that will be worse off. In April 2016, when these cuts to work allowances come into effect, I think on the 10th of April, or the 11th of April, uh, we estimate there'll be 96,000 people in work on universal credit, about 250,000 people on universal credit overall, but about 96,000 of those will be in work. So they're the ones that stand to lose out, those 96,000, and there's no mitigation in place for those households. I think the government's response will be that, well, actually, they just need to work a few more hours or increase their earnings, which I'm about to come on and talk about what, how easy that will be for those households. Then um, there's an additional set of households when we modeled this all the way through to 2020. When you don't take into account transitional protection, 2.1 million households in work will still be worse off in 2020, assuming no behavioral change and assuming um, and not taking into account the trans transitional protection that the DWP plan to have in place, um, which is there to ensure that people aren't worse off on UC. Sorry about that, at the point of transition. Now, we talked earlier about uh, the DWP's response, saying that actually people can get through this just by working additional hours. So we modeled this, um, and we looked at the modeling for 2016, so next year. And we looked at how many additional hours across the country would need to be worked to make up that loss in work allowance. It's not as simple as the gross earn as, um, this is how much you lost, this is how much you need to earn. You need to earn more in order to be no worse off in net terms so after tax and after benefit withdrawal. And because your benefits are being withdrawn, your earnings need to increase much more than uh, perhaps that you might, you might first think. So our initial analysis found that I think people across the country would need to find an additional 10 million hours in order to not be any worse off at their current level of earnings. 
at the same time, because universal credit is less generous, one of the reasons universal credit was being introduced was to make um, w- was to encourage people to take those steps into work and to work more. And the DWP estimated that that would increase the hours worked per week by somewhere between one and two point five million. Because it's less generous, you could argue that actually you won't see that dynamic effect. Um, certainly not to the maximum of two and a half million. It might not drop by quite as much as two and a half million, but I think that dynamic effect will be significantly weakened. At the same time, the ABR estimate that the national living wage will mean that around 60,000 jobs will be lost, which we estimate is about 1. million hours per week. So you've got this, you know, we've got quite a buoyant economy, employment is high, but at the same time, in order for people to be no worse off, they're going to find, need to find these additional hours or become more productive. And what we're saying here is that finding those additional hours won't be easy because there are a lot of additional hours that need to be found while the hours available um, are arguably falling. Um, this can be overcome through improved productivity, but that just really says what the, what exactly what that challenge is, is that um, skilling people up and making them more effective will be really important. And then the political side of, the, of that policy debate is that um, the Chancellor really wants universal credit to roll out uh, effectively for the first time um, because it's through the rollout of universal credit that he gets his savings. This green line that's growing shows how savings build up as universal credit rolls out and accelerates. So he wants universal credit to be rolled out as quickly as possible um, by 2021. Now, the reason I think that's a bit of a challenge is that what the Chancellor's done there is I think he's prioritised the public finances over the personal finances of people in work. That's exactly the same debate that was happening when the cuts to tax credits were repealed. And um, I think that's what will happen in the run up to the next general election as um, conservative backbenchers start to see more and more of their constituents move on to universal credit, more and more of their circumstances change, and more and more letters pointing out that actually I'm in work, I'm doing the right thing, you know, all the stuff you want me to do, and yet I'm worse off. So I do think there's an opportunity to revisit this, and that's why. Um, Lord Kirkwood's intervention in the Lords yesterday, that's something we were pleased to support and something that we hope will continue to build momentum, particularly in the run up to April this year, as these cuts come into effect, and then all the way through to 2020, up until, I suppose, a different decision is made. We asked our chair baby what she thought of universal credit cuts. And as you can see, the newest member of the policy and practice team was not too happy about it. I just thought uh, it's quite a serious topic, so it's important to <laughs> lighten the mood um, once in a while. So, Janet, over to you, Um, or perhaps I can do this and just kick off the first poll. Um, Janet, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, Devin, it would be be easier, I think, if you served it from your controls. I'm struggling, I have to say, that I can't can't see the polls on here, so perhaps we can do it in the follow-up survey. Okay. Um... So, yeah, we'll probably send a couple of polls through afterwards, but I think it's worthwhile just pausing for a second and feel free to uh, enter your comments in, in the chat box. Um, but the what it's saying is, do you know what impact welfare reforms will have on each of your households? Um, and I think, Janet, do you remember what the responses were? Janet? Hi, Devin. Yeah, I think the the question that we were asking everybody um, was, if I just get my points in front of me, um, what do you know about the impact welfare reforms will have on each of your households? Um, so the answers were going to be uh, how much each household will lose due to the benefit cap, which tenure is most effective by the LHA cap? Which type of household will be most hit by under-occupation? What the average weekly reduction in council tax support scheme will be for each household? And which households are hit by all reforms cumulatively now and in the future? It's just worth- so those were the, the, sorry, Devon, yep. Yeah, no, it's just just worth thinking about, and um, perhaps we'll ask ask some of those questions in the follow-up because it'd be helpful for us to know how much analysis you've been able to do yourself, and perhaps where some of our work might be able to help. So, um, as we talk about delivery, which I think is, as Janet said, something that's always um, a very big topic, 
it's worthwhile talking about an approach we've taken to help um, councils across the country, uh, most recently Haringey Council, but also Birmingham, Leeds, Newcastle, Hounslow um, and others by taking data sets that they have, um, taking them anonymized, so with all of the personally identifiable information redacted, running them through our policy modeling engine, which I'll show you shortly, to, to give them a detailed um, assessment of the impact. And um, the next slide shows how we're able to do that. So you can see the impact of, let's say, one reform right here. If you add up all reforms together, you can see that the impact might be much more severe. And again, this is something that I think is um, sometimes is, people find quite challenging to do, um, even just modeling more than one policy area. You can then start to see the impact on, uh, on a local area and even each of those wards within their local area. But there aren't too main, many data sets that allow you to look at it, at, um, certainly the impact of benefit changes at the neighborhood level, local, local super output area level. Um, and there are very few indeed that allow you to pinpoint the impact on each individual household. And what I'm saying is that's exactly what we do. So we start at this level, we start at this household level, and we build up that picture for you so you can understand the impact on each individual household, their neighborhood, each ward, and uh, your local area um, in total. And we do that by running um, the data sets that uh, local authorities are able to provide to us through uh, our software engine. I think it's worthwhile showing you that briefly because if you think about um, how people sometimes struggle to understand the impact of um, basically, so we've we've just done a we've made a couple of updates to our software to allow to allow us to identify which households would be able to claim universal credit. So there's a case here for Leonardo. He's come in to check whether or not he'd be able to claim universal credit as a single person. This is his postcode. And the system will then tell him that from the details you've entered, you are eligible for universal credit. We and that will show you the results for universal credit. If I were to go back, make him a couple, I think this is an area, I've selected an area where I think it's not eligible for couples, but it is eligible for single people. For the details you've entered, you are not eligible for universal credit, and it's showing the results for both the current benefit system and universal credit side by side, but you could choose just to show them for the current system. And I think that's, an, that's um, quite a useful and an important point. Um, the things we normally focus on is being able to show actually what is the work incentive effect. I think we do that very effectively in a very visual way. And then we might be able, be able to help Leonardo um, find a job. So he'll look for a frontline advisor job, and hopefully, or maybe I've put too much of a keyword in there. There are jobs available. I'm not sure whether mortgage advisor is what I had in mind. And then the system also models universal credit today and in the future. So you can see here that Leonardo's, um, in this case, because it's showing the, the results in work, he's actually better off in work. Um, in this instance. Uh, so I just skipped through that quickly, but that's, it's, that's the system that we're able to run each one of these households on. Um, and I mentioned some of the authorities we'd worked with most recently, um, uh, Haringey and also Hounslow. So Hounslow wanted to take a proactive approach to the next round of welfare reforms. This meant having a strong analysis of the impact on each of their households. By knowing that, they're able to put a plan together um, and sort of be on the front foot and target activity effectively. And that's what the policy and practice analysis has helped them to do. So on to universal credit, their delivery. It's worthwhile remembering, you know, we've talked a lot about the policy and what's happening. I think there's been a lot of skepticism about whether it's ready to roll out. So universal credit was first introduced in April 2013. It had uh, a number of issues which slowed it significantly, which I'll come on to show you. Um, the claimant groups are quite simple to work with, typically single childless, um, it's now uh, in a number of areas for families. But the rollout's now being expanded to more and more areas, more and more complex cases, and it's also um, the digital rollout is starting to expand as well. Again, most recently, I think this week, the full service job centre was available and the full digital service was became available in Hounslow. At the same time, uh, the skepticism is understandable. Rollout's been delayed at least three times in the last three years. 
And I think one of the questions, one of the other polls that we had for you, and we'd love your feedback on, is that is UC's digital delivery now back on track? So this is what's happened. The original rollout assumption was very optimistic, I think, for political reasons. And I think there have been a number of issues since then. But we're coming up to this point. Universal credit is starting to reach, I think it's an 80% of, over 80% of all job centers already. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to know whether or not you think it is going to reach that wider group, uh, whether it will be or So that's the next poll. Is UC rollout now on track and ready to accelerate? And uh, if the polls were working, we've had a few technical issues here, but if the polls were working, I think the options there for you were, and again, we'd love your comments. The options for you there were, yes, it's on track. It'll be in every job center by April 2016, and it will accelerate. Yes, it won't be in every job center by April 2016, but it will get there eventually. And then when it's there, it will accelerate. Um, yes, it'll get into every job center, but it won't accelerate. And uh, the final one is that um, it won't really do either of those things. Universal credit uh, is going to continue to have these significant issues. And I, the reason, it's a real shame the poll isn't working, because I'd love to get a snapshot with that and share it with you all immediately, because um, because I think what the sense I'm getting from talking to people is that it is starting to happen. You know, People start to feel that universal credit is real. Um, it's starting to reach out. Janet, were you going to come in there? Yeah, I was just going to suggest maybe a show of hands. Who thinks it's going to uh, accelerate and who thinks it's actually going to suffer another substantial delay? Hmm. Yeah, who thinks it's going to accelerate is probably the easiest way. Do show your hand if you think it's going to accelerate. Yeah, there's quite a few in there. There's more than, more than I would have expected and more and more popping up. So we've got a, about one third who say it's on track and ready to accelerate. So the roadmap to 2020, um, so just focusing on it in, in April 2016, and it's worthwhile thinking about, well, it's not just about it being a lot, being uh, starting to affect people today um, and more and more people in the roadmap to April 2016, because when it does reach people, there are going to be, there are outstanding concerns and issues. So I think one of the biggest ones we come across, perhaps because we speak a lot with housing providers and we're working with a number of housing associations um, already, is the housing cost element, the payment mechanism and whether or not vulnerable residents are, are ready to receive a single monthly payment directly to the household and how much support they'll need to begin to manage that. Um, I think many people will be able to manage that, but I think if you add on to that cuts in their work allowance and it being less generous than the system today, I think you're starting to mix two separate issues, not having enough money and perhaps not necessarily having the capability when you put them together. I think that is something that uh, is going to be very difficult for residents. Second issue that we often get asked about, the assessment period, timing issues in RTI. Um, and um, it's important, I suppose. We've had a lot of questions in the past and we'll, we'll post a few responses on our blog, perhaps send that out to those, those of you that attended and registered, um, that actually when you make your claim does have an impact on your universal credit award. I think that's a feature of the live service. I can't believe that that's not something that they will ultimately choose to resolve when the digital service is fully up and running. So there's no reason why they couldn't pay out universal credit according to the basis upon which you moved into your property um, or on the date of birth of your child as opposed to when you made the claim. There's no reason why that wouldn't be possible. I do think some of these things will resolve themselves over time, but they are issues today. In-work conditionality, I think in-work support is welcome, but um, whether in-work conditionality is um, is welcome, whether JCP are ready to apply conditionality to people who are already in work and already trying to do the right thing is, I think, uh, is an important question. Um, passported benefits still haven't been resolved, and we've campaigned heavily for free school meals for all children on universal credit, not simply because we're fans of free school meals and, and additional support for people on low incomes, but also because uh, it really affects people's work incentives, almost in the same way or in a bigger way as, as, as the cuts to work allowances do. Because if you lose your free school meals, you then need to earn significantly more in, either, in order to pay for them. And then the local role, USDL, universal support delivered locally. Uh, we've been evaluating that um, for the DWP, so I can't say too much about it. But I think there is an interesting, um, from the local authorities we've talked to, not just those involved in that pilot, but um, whether or not 
their focus is quite quite narrow on helping people to make a UC claim or a broader one of providing more holistic support and joined up services. And often those that we work with with the impact assessment work are taking that broader, want to take a more holistic approach to supporting their residents and understanding how they're affected um, in its entirety. I'm going to pause there for a quick second. Um, I'm going to review some of the questions that were asked. Janet, I'm not sure whether you can see the questions that others have asked. Oh, lovely baby, I need a photo. That's a, that's a, <laughs> thank, thank you for that question. Um, uh, there's a few comments and questions in here saying uh, it's starting to happen. Um, and some, some, you know, I think, I think that does say something that's quite important. Uh, quite a lot of good words around the Leading Lights Network and more and more people wanting to be involved. If you have questions about universal credit, do post them up here. Do start to post them and I'll start answering them as I go. There are a number of questions that were asked following the last webinar that I think it's worthwhile touching on um, before I hand back to Janet. So the first uh, question, I think there were quite a few questions about the software from last time because I did a slightly longer demonstration. Does the calculator spot exemptions from the seven day waiting period? I mean, there are a whole range of exemptions that effectively relate to your circumstances before um, if you're making a JSA claim uh, in the last three months and then you move on to UC, you don't have the seven day waiting period, for example. Um, it's difficult because you need to know what their circumstances were before. We do have guidance in there that um, when you hover over on the software, the, the advisor can know what questions to ask, but they do need to ask those questions. Does the calculator allow non-specialist advisors to spot these exemptions? Yes, I suppose that's the, that's the question. I, 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 same response to the answer I, I just gave. Um, but uh, extra benefits and, and what support they might be entitled to. Yes, it does, um, based on the response to the questions, and it also posts links at the end of the um, at the end of this at the end of the calculation to say actually here's where you then click to go and apply for um, for that support. The claimant analysis shows projected future changes, but do you then go back to the claimant to tell them of new changes? As I tried to show you very briefly, we model the impact of the current system and also the future system, so you can show them both in that first meeting um, to say, here's how you're, you're impacted, here's how you'll be impacted in the future, and here's how you'll be impacted if you choose to do this to change your circumstances. And that's been very powerful in the case of the benefit cap. If you think about a reduced benefit cap, many households that aren't impacted today will be impacted in the future. Being able to show them that visually through the chart is important, and also being able to show them the carrot of if they were to move into work, how they'd no longer be affected by the cap. Uh, has been really powerful. I think Lewisham used that to really good effect when the cap was introduced last time around. The fourth question, I understand that many people will be worse off in work under UC than the current system. However, once people are on UC, are they almost always better off in work than not in work or in work more than little work? Uh, well, yes, and this, that, that feature of UC has stayed. So um, you are, once you're on UC, you are better off in work than not in work and you're better off earning more than not earning more, which wasn't always the feature under the current system. Um, you could argue, and I'm sure many people on this webinar would argue that there are um, costs associated with going to work and sometimes the, the um, extra support you get through universal credit doesn't cover those costs. Um, and that's, that, is, that is true. But I think on the whole, in principle, universal credit, though it's less generous, the sort of structural principles of it remain, you do get to keep more of your earnings as you move into work. Fifth question, have we done any assessment on the impact of changes of circumstances and awards of UC changing from the beginning of the assessment period? Will this have a, in, in particular, this will have an impact on rent arrears? Um, housing costs have been removed from the beginning of the assessment period, regardless of the fact that the claimant had liability for the majority of the assessment period. I think this really depends on whether they're moving in or whether they're moving out. So if they're moving in, they might make a claim, they'll get their housing costs for the whole of that assessment period, which, act, which can actually be quite positive for them, but the housing association would only charge them for, I suppose, the time they're in the property. If they're moving out, then they might lose their housing costs for the whole of that period and then leave the housing association in, uh, in sort of, um, having to chase them for the money, I suppose, um, which would be very difficult because they hadn't been given the money. I do think this is one of those things that will be um, tackled over time because I don't think it's sustainable. And I think digitally, the digital rollout will help people um, to deal with that. Um, and would you examine if there was entitlement to PIP, carers allowance, uh, incapacity to work, 
to increase universal credit and get access to a work allowance. Um, that's not something we do at the moment, but we are working with a number of welfare to work providers and we're talking to them about the health and work program. We've mapped a small number of, um, uh, I suppose, health related support that might be relevant to people um, on low incomes in receipt of some of these benefits. And what we'd like to do is figure out what triggers there are to say, actually, this might be some support that's worth you looking into. So that's something that is uh, definitely an aim and an ambition. OK, um, if there are any other questions, do ask them. Um, I'd love to uh, love to uh, answer them. Um, and Janet, I'll hand over to you now. Great, Devon. Thank you very much. And uh, apologies, everybody, for um, the technical problems that we've had this morning where we've not been able to show our polls. Uh, because as Devon was saying, we do really uh, appreciate and we do enjoy uh, the interactive nature of our webinars. So um, a bit disappointing that we're not able to hear from you. But anyway, we shall, we shall persevere and we'll move on. Uh, I've just put this slide in here because we, we like it and we agree with it. Um, uh, w. Edwards Deming, a data scientist who says, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Um, so there you go. Um, moving on then to the uh, next steps, what happens here now. Um, we've, got, uh, we, we've, done really, we've done really well on time. It's probably because we weren't able to serve the polls. Um, so we're just coming up to quarter past 11 now. Um, but I just wanted to uh, just cover off some next steps. Um, after the webinar finishes, immediately after the webinar finishes, you will, you will get served a very short survey. Um, it's, it's automatic, it'll come up on your screen. Um, and we'd really appreciate if you could fill that in to give us some feedback. Um, and also, it's, it's where you can ask for um, clarity on any areas of this presentation. Um, we do know that there's quite a lot of complexity in what we've talked about, and often, as is the way with these, when you're very close to it, sometimes you can count us through without meaning to. So if there's any clarity that you want on any of the areas that we've covered, um, then please do say in the survey. Um, there's also the ability for you to request a call for us to um, talk to you one-on-one -on -one about how we could structure a welfare reform impact assessment for your area. Uh, and what it might mean for your area. There are differences by area. We've done, um, as Devon said, we've done some recent work with Handler and Harrogate uh, and others in London, but also um, other organisations throughout the country. Um, it's very interesting for us to see the differences and indeed the similarities as well. Um, so each area is different. So if you want to talk about um, how it might work for your area and, and uh, what the pricing, what the benefits might be, then do, do ask. Um, there's also then the opportunity for you to request a sample of the report that we give uh, when we do the welfare reform impact assessment analysis. Um, it's a bit of a weighty tomb, uh, but it's very useful um, for uh, colleagues and, and officers to, for example, get insights that they can then um, explain to cabinet members what the impacts of certain reforms may be, aggregate, cumulative or whatever, uh, things like that. So if you can see, uh, if you want to see what those reports look like, uh, do, do shout. And also if you want to see what some of our customers' uh, testimonials say, then, then there is that opportunity there as well. So it's only, I've made it sound much bigger than it is, it's not, it's very quick. Um, uh, so don't be put off, it's a very short survey, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, so that leaves me then to finish up um, and just to, uh, on behalf of Devon and I, to say thank you very much for attending. It's been our most popular webinar ever, uh, which we're delighted by. Um, and here are the contact details for Devon directly. Uh, and also, so uh, Devon Galani, Devon at policyandpractice.co.uk. Devon's phone number there, and also you can find Devon on Twitter. Uh, and indeed, our general uh, email address of policy and practice is hello at policyandpractice.co.uk. And you can find lots of resources on our website as well. Um, so, Devon, if you wanted to say any final words, over to you. Yeah, no, I think, I think just to finish, there are two points I wanted to make. So a couple of people, um, just looking through the, the questions and comments that were made, a couple of people have um, asked a few more questions about the Leading Lights Network. So we'll share more, um, if you're on our mailing list, we'll share more about that to you. I think it is important that some of the consensus we're trying to build, I'm sure most people on this um, webinar would agree with me that actually some of these cuts to work allowances are going to be um, uh, very difficult 
for people and really don't meet the government's own objectives in terms of rewarding work. So I think any support you can give us or any any things we can do to work together and, and create one voice around some of this would be really powerful. And finally, there was one question that said, um, that's a gorgeous picture of your baby. We need a picture of, uh, of a smile sometimes. And I think if we do work together on reversing some of those cuts to, uni to universal credit work allowances, I think we might see one very soon, uh, perhaps on the next webinar. Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I will um, stop the webinar now. And um, yeah, it's been, um, thank you very much for joining us. If you have any questions, do please respond to the survey as, um, as Janet mentioned. Um, and we might add a few questions in there uh, about the poll and perhaps you can respond and we'll collate those ourselves. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.